just want to give you a little bit of uh, 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 information about Leila Khalifa, tonight's uh, speaker. She began her studies in Amman, Jordan, at University of uh, Jordan in social sciences and history. And then she went to England, pursued her uh, postgraduate research in uh, social psychology at the University of Nottingham. That was in 1985. And she, she was awarded her MA in classical and modern Islamic thought at the Sorbonne in France in 1988. And she has dedicated her research to the study of Ibn Arabi's doctrine and received her PhD in uh, 2000 in history and civilization. And uh, <clears throat> then she worked, uh, well, she worked with uh, famous professor Michel Shotkovich and um, she completed her dissertation, um, uh, Conquest, Elimination, Sufism and Prophecy, the Futuva in Ibn Arabi. Uh, she continues her research in uh, Ibn Arabi's metaphysical doctrine. Um, she participated in a lot of international symposiums, which I had the honor to uh, meet her at the uh, Harakani Symposium in Istanbul. And uh, she published uh, books and articles. So I'm just gonna give the uh, honor to Leila Khalifa uh, to talk tonight. In the name of God, the most merciful, most gracious, the most merciful, and peace be upon Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon you all. The uh, difficulties of our time and the current pandemic doesn't mean the absence of divine gentleness as today we live in a, a blessed time as well. We witness a great uh, uh, witness uh, the great in, uh, establishment of uh, Akbarian school if even al Arabi here in Istanbul under the auspices of a doctor. Uh, Mahmoud uh, Erol Kilic, uh, a window to both the East and the West in collaboration with the Institute of Karim Vakfi, a scholarly institute headed by uh, Jiman Lur Hoja and includes a number of great scholars such as Mustafa Taherli, may God grant him a speedy recovery. Therefore, we are celebrating this long awaiting project. This uh, interest in the Burian School goes hand in hand with the interest shown by Oxford Institute, one of the first institutes which showed a, seri a serious interest in the heritage of Sheikh Al Akbar. I'd like to greet all our great audiences who, is, uh, who are watching us through their smart windows. I will start, I'd like also to greet the interpreters. Professor Mahmoud Kilic started this blessed series in on Ibn al-Arabi last week by discussing the uh, disciples of Ibn al-Arabi, especially in Anatolia, Anatolia, a place which had a great impact on establishing the foundation of Akbarian school. And I hope these lectures would have a great influence in combining the East and the West through Akbarian gnosis. The scholars engaged with the school of Ibn al-Arabi had discussed many important Akbarian concepts. For example, the late uh, Mitchell uh, uh, Chugowicz, may uh, Allah have mercy upon him, explained the hazards of, of delving into Ibn al-Arabi's ocean without chores. And thus he provided us with a life jacket through expounding essential issues such as the issue of the seal of saints, uh, uh, Khatimiyat al-Wilaya. Also, uh, Professor, uh, uh, also Professor, uh, uh, also, Professor Abdel Fattah Mufti introduced the Quranic uh, Gnostic universal and numeral keys to Ibn al-Arabi's texts. Moreover, Prof. William Michitik discussed the science of revelations and opening and followed its manifestation in the Persian and Turkish schools. As for Professor Suad al-Hakim, she succeeded in climbing the mounts of Ibn al-Arabi and his openings in the world of Gnostic knowledge and provided the most important Dictionary for the searcher of the Akbarian wisdom. The Akbarian heritage is based on the Quran, and that's why it is described 
as ocean with no shores, but also its bottomless sea. I will discuss some of the essential issues in Ibn al-Arabi's school, whose teachings in the Gnostic knowledge and spiritual jurisprudence is distinguished with the integration of different uh, hermeneutical and Gnostic styles and methods. In some issues, we find the Ibn al-Arabi in agreement with the Mu'tazilati's opinion, and in another issue, he would side with the Ash'aris. Ash'aritis, Ibn al-Arabi would also explain different schools of jurisprudence, and we find him agreeing with one and disagreeing with another, explaining the divine origin and the reason of the differences between the schools of jurisprudence. Ibn al-Arabi asks that people of revelation have the liberty of the of uh, delving deep into all schools, views, religions, and groups, and kino, and they know where the similarities and differences are. They also realize each science and its divine origin. Therefore, the wise Gnostic is the one who combines the divine, natural, mathematical, logical sciences by means provided through both the faculty of intellect and the granted gift. The granted gift is a divine flow which results in openings of revelation and witnessing. We see Ibn al-Arabi discussing the concept of opening the doors of divine revelation and closing it and how all nations are created from the Mohammedan prisons. Ibn al-Arabi also discussed how to open the locked lock the treasures to, of divine generosity and explains the key names of being. Ibn al-Arabi expounds as well the divine openings of night and day, along with many other illuminating openings. Ibn al-Arabi is distinguished by his methodology in explaining mystical jurisprudence as he brings the Sharia rulings to its divine origin as nothing in this universe lacks a divine origin. In other words, every image in this world is representing a similar divine image. Ibn al-Arabi explains it through his methodology how the initiation of divine sciences comes from both the Quran and the divine attributes with its different presence. Thus, God is not known through his own divine self, but through his divine names, which are the active door, doors in the universe. Ibn al-Arabi is also careful to explain the shares of both God and the servant from the realities of the divine names and attributes while keeping the principles of the unity of being intact uh, intact through maintaining a balanced understanding of the concept of the transcendence and anthrop uh, anthropomorphism. God is omniscient or all-knowing with no ignorance, whereas the human being is knowledgeable with ignorance. God is the all-rich as he didn't create creation out of need to them. As for the servant, he can be rich or the servant of the rich, but he will always remain in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, makam of fakr. That means the place of being poor and the need to God. Through his, this fine understanding, Ibn al-Arabi measures the meanings of the divine names and its presence, explaining what distinguishes the truth of God from creation in all divine names. In this context, Ibn al-Arabi refers to a secret which is described as wondrous secret, which we considered as the golden rule in studying the methodology of Ibn al-Arabi, especially in using interpretation in, the, in his school. He says, I draw your attention to it without explanation because it doesn't bear any explanation. From this, we understand that this secret is from the comprehensive realities or the scientific constants, to, so to speak, as every science has its own constants, a scientific text and a methodology. Sufism so as both science and methodology, this scientific basis are summarized as follows. God strikes examples for himself and for him no examples are struck. So he is similar to things, but things are not similar to him. So it's said that God in his relationship to his creation is like a, a king to his kingdom 
kingdom, but it would be wrong to say the king and his kingdom is like God to his creation. This issue is understood through the example of the mirror. The image uh, in the mirror is similar to the one who looks at the mirror, but not vice versa. Thus, God is what is manifested, but what is manifested is not him, just like he is the manifest at the time of manifestation. He is also the hidden, and that's why we say that he is similar to things, but things are not similar to him, as he is either uh, as he is their essence, but they are not his essence, and that is a strange knowledge. In theology, this concept is considered one of the obvious things which do not bear explanation. This divine principle explains to us why God in Islam is being worshipped in all images, as God says in the Quran, for your Lord has decreed de has decreed that you worship none but him because he is the essence of every image but the image is not his essence according to his uh, according to his understanding uh, uh, he explains the divine spiritual and natural secrets in uh, juristic rulings of the quran and the sunnah uh, and this is related to quran uh, where the, uh, the scholars, uh, according to his understanding, Ibn al-Arabi explains the divine, spiritual, and natural secrets in, just, in, in juristic rulings of the Quran and the Sunnah. Ibn al-Arabi, being the most qualified person to describe his sciences, says that they are the tongues of the Sharia. He goes farther to explain saying it's known that there is the unforeseen, but it's known what is in uh, in it or what is it so when the divine news are delivered by the angels to the messengers and thus to us the believer of these divine news leaves his thought behind and accepts the news with his intellect and believes the deliverer of a news here ibn al-harabi describes that the uh, the prerequisite for the intellectual and the theoretical mind to be prepared to receive the, the divine relation is to accept to receive knowledge both about this world and the hereafter, and especially the sciences of the hereafter, which goes way beyond the intellectual cap capacity of the mind. There is nothing but God in the universe is contingent. There is nothing but God and the universe is manifest. This is what Ibn al-Arabi says. From this perspective, Ibn al-Arabi pays attention to the Gnostic mythical and spiritual aspects of the Sharia and its pillars. We take, for example, the methodology of Ibn al-Arabi in explaining the spiritual jurisprudence of ritual cleanliness, the ablution and the usage of water to wash and wipe out or dry a pollution with purified sand or soil. A pollution has a noble status which results in a divine proximity. Ibn al-Arabi explains the secrets of ablution crossing over from the literal understanding of ablution to its spiritual significance. His, he expounds that divine proximity is attained either by the secret of life, water, which is used to witness the self subsisting the eternal, or by, or by returning back to the origin of the creation and the father of the natural growth of all things the origin of all the children, which is the element of soil and the earth. Thus, we have water to witness the self-subsisting, the eternal, or soil in order to contemplate the origin of a human being. Ibn al-Arabi considers the term opening with all its different meanings and images, such as opening the door, opening in new territories, expansions of the chest, elimination of veils, and the manifestations following it are all related to the meaning of opening. These openings are a divine provision which functions as witness to the divine sciences. These openings are a divine provision which functions as a witness to the divine sciences revealed by the tongues of Sharia. It wouldn't be wrong to say that for Ibn al-Arabi, the sciences of manifestations and openings is similar to the sciences of intellectual reasoning.
Ibn al Arabi says that ijtihad is it, sh it shouldn't be in total it should be in total harmony and in line with Quranic scripture and prophetic traditions with no contradictions. In other words, these openings should be rather based on the Quran and the Sunnah as its origin. According to Ibn al-Arabi, uh, ijtihad is not about issuing a new ruling, but it means to introduce an evidence from the Quran or the Sunnah. This was always the case of the openings of Ibn al-Arabi, which was thoroughly de detected by Professor Abdul Aziz al-Mansub, uh, al um, who edited in completion the book of uh, Futuhat and confirms that Ibn al-Arabi resorted to the Quran more than 10,000 times and referred to the prophetic traditions more than 3,000 times. All credit goes to Professor Muhammad, uh, Mahmoud al-Ghurab, who took upon his shoulder the mission of collecting all the Quranic verses and the prophetic traditions with its uh, proper sources and publishing it. This greatly served the researchers of the works of Ibn al-Arabi, who emphasized that taking prophetic traditions as an uh, authentic source and a divine Quranic uh, command, God says, whatever the prophet has given you, take it. Openings for Ibn al-Arabi is uh, neither inner psychological experiences reflected in interpreting issues related to gnosis nor intellectual, philosophical, and theoretical concepts used in interpreting scriptural texts. Using the tongue and the language of the Sharia and the prophetic wisdom is necessary. Also, opening the door is necessary. Otherwise, all what is behind the door is only feeling and not science. The science of opening when it is in total compliance to the science of Shara is seen as a tool of confirmation of what is believed by the mind in the sciences of the Sharia through witnessing by the heart its actualization in reality. In other words, the aspirant uh, traverses from the belief of limitation to the belief of witnessing or moving from the certainty of knowledge Al-Milyaqeen to the vision of the truth or the eye of certainty, Ayn al -yaqeen. And finally, to the last stage of the truth, certainty, Haqq al -yaqeen. This means that the aspirant who aims to receive opening moves it from the sailor illuminating sciences to the opening sciences of a prophetic no, uh, nocturnal period. The path to God varies between day work and night work, or between night journey and divine divine ascendance or between expansion and contraction, rigid spiritually, spiritual exercises and intimate uh, converse, totality and details between the sciences of the Makan opening and the perils of a prophetic uh, aphorism. As for Ibn al-Arabi emphasis on the importance of the opening to, to be Makan, it's true that Ibn al-Arabi had a special opening during his presence in Mecca as the divine command of writing down these openings was revealed to him. But the reason goes way farther as the openings were the constant factor which accompanied all his journeys starting from Andalusia. To him, Mecca represents the abode of a blessing, blessings. As for guidance and the clear signs, it symbolizes the Muhammadan heart and the throne of the Arabic Quran, which is the pivot around which all the pilgrim students circum uh, uh, circumambulate around. Pilgrim to God, as Ibn al-Arabi says, is contemplating God's knowledge through the path of witnessing. Ibn al-Arabi similarizes the student of knowledge to the pilgrim who needs to perform some prerequisites in order to be prepared for the status of ihram. And then comes circumpilation, tawa, tawaf, tra uh, traversing between Mount Safa and Marwa, throwing a stone, standing in Arafah, staying overnight in Mina, slaughtering animals, and only then the student can celebrate understanding divine knowledge and be joyful with God's divine relation of Quranic secrets and juristic rulings, which are received directly by the Kaaba. 
Kaaba uh, of the heart, which is the pivot of divine knowledge and the abode of divine protection. Here, Ibn al-Arabi draws the attention of the requester of openings to the importance of opening the Kaaba of one's heart first before conquering the realms of the self. The heart opening is the one which will protect the fruits of both the sensual and spiritual openings of all realms. According to Ibn al-Arabi's teachings, opening is one but has two lights, just as existence in one but has two beginnings, and religion is one but has two degrees. For the opening, the first light is an opening from God, which is a great victory, and the second opening comes from the side of creation, which results from eagerness and self-preparation to conquer the self and contemplating the openings. These two lights should both meet. To sum it up, there is no immigration after the opening of the Mecca of the heart, but opening continue in this, the sensual realms. The Arabi was going to name the book of Al-Futuhat, al makkiya as only a Fatah al makki but then he changed his, mid, his mind to the plural and became... Al-Futuhat, Ibn al-Arabi explains that the word openings remain, reminds us of the Islamic openings or conquests occurred after the opening of Mecca and demolishing the idols. So it was an uh, Ibrahimic scenery with Muhammadan origin, which resulted in the outreach of the guidance of the Quran from the Kaaba of the Arabian Peninsula and Jerus to Jerusalem, Levant area, Persian world and Khurazan, where the uh, Malamitiya school f flourished. Passing over to China, the land of knowledge, and India, the, the land of wisdom, the knowledge of the Quran, also spread to Anadolia and Egypt and off to North Africa until it reached Morocco and Andalusia. The aspirant of the openings of Gnostic knowledge should contemplate these macrocosmic issues and benefit from it in his micro, uh, micro, uh, microcosmic world. Ibn al-Arabi adds that when it comes to guidance, people has different states in times of concealment and re revelation of Gnosis. In this regard, Ibn al-Arabi says in poetry, people are either guiding or be guided, some of them to the Levant and others to Egypt. Whatever is related to the Levant would be seen present, and if it belongs to Egypt, it would be seen alive. And if they remember my spirit, I long to Egypt. As for the city of Baghdad, he says, Baghdad is my home and I don't see any home for me but it. Then Ibn al-Arabi would become a guest in the land of wisdom saying, I, want to in I went to India in hope of meeting a sage whose sea would overflow the land. Then he reaches China where he said, we stayed in China in the darkness of the night in buildings with a great height. Ibn al-Arabi always resorts to divine knowledge, spiritual subti uh, subtleties, symbols, and aphorisms in his poetry. So he sometimes mentions the mysterious symbols in, per uh, in Persia and other times. He refers to its fine order and its buildings. He also mentions the beauty of the Roman girls and doesn't forget the Quran of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, Yemen, Lubna of uh, Gad, uh, Gadamish, Zahar of Tunisia, and the Virgin, the Virgin of Fiz. Ibn al-Arabi spent a lot of his time traveling, connecting different cities to the Mecca of his heart until he settled in Damascus, where he was buried. The scholars who are specialized in the works of Ibn al-Arabi would agree on the importance of his work as well as the difficulty of his writings. Some of them would find the difficulty in the language of Ibn al-Arabi as they consider it any clear. Other would find the difficulty in the great number of his works, which is spread over thousands of papers. 
when it comes to issue of the difficulty of the language of Ibn Arabi as a matter of fact, his language is a pure correct Arabic as he is the son of this language and its master, he mastered and owned it and used it perfectly to express his thoughts in the field of science and gnosis. Ibn Arabi was fluent in the principles of grammar and the rulings of jurisprudence along with his eloquent and rhetoric. I was new nature to love the Arabic language and my father was one of the great figures of the Arabic language which he taught to his children and the students who learned to love and respect it. It's also the language of the Quran and the language of science and beauty. But I never realized the full breadth and depth of the Arabic language and its ability to explain Gnostic issue until I started engaging with Ibn al-Arabi. I witnessed how the language turned into a loyal servant fulfilling the task of expressing what her master wishes. For Ibn al-Arabi, Arabic was like the horse to the, to the jockey who takes the horse to whatever way he wishes. Thus, Ibn al-Arabi used to express celestial, celestial, spiritual, terrestrial, sensual, or imaginative meanings. This language has an amazing ability for expression, which Ibn al-Arabi mastered. Ibn al-Arabi considers it essential to realize the Gnostic dimensions of the terms of the Arabic language as it is the language of the soul, just as the non-Arabic language are for the sen senses. Therefore, Ibn al-Arabi finds it necessary to establish a strong foundational basis of the Arabic language before the specialist delves into openings. Establishing a strong foundational basis requires to read the obscurity of the non-Arabic language in the light of the clarity of the sciences of the Arabic languages. language. Also, reading partial realities should be done in light of total realities so far. So for example, when we discuss the realities of the land of truth, al-simisma, we shouldn't deal with it spiritually away from the realities of the heavens and the earth, and we shouldn't kill it to understand it as this is only a discussion to the dead. As for this uh, dissecting gnosis, it is a divine dissection which requires its life to be intact in order to understand the science of the cosmic world and its Arabic explanation. So the issue of Arabic and non-Arabic languages for Ibn al-Arabi goes beyond the issues of a prejudice, of a prejudice, racism, or eth ethnicity. Arabic represents for him the language of a clarification and understanding which leads to wake, wakefulness, and that is the goal of the Gnostic path, as its essence is understanding divine unity with God and God by God in every atom and minute article of existence. Ibn al-Arabi in the chapter of uh, Mujahada in the book of Al-Futuhat uh, narrates that he saw a dream in which he was asked to engage the three small letters in every chapter and that he has to show how these three compound letters are composed of long vowel uh, or weak letter, huruf al ila which are uh, the alif, wa, ya. This means that Ibn al-Arabi used the logic of the Arabic language to explain the logic of Gnostic issues. This was also observed by Masinun in the writing of Halaj, as he notes that Halaj Gnostic methodology is based on the Arabic grammar, especially the three main grammatical cases, nominative, accusative, and uh, uh, genitive. Messaging be uh, uh, believes that Halaj was influenced by the Arab grammarians in Basra and Al Khalil. Thus, he, the researchers should be aware of the great influence of the Arabic language. As for the issue of the massive production of Al Akbarian heritage, massive production of any writer requires for sure both time and effort from the reader, but the production of the author is not necessarily described as difficult. The huge Akbarian heritage represents its diversity in Gnostics.
sciences which are always supported by Quranic proof and divine evidence. Thus, we find that Ibn al-Arabi resorts to the writings of various Muslim scholars in different fields of knowledge. For example, Ibn al-Arabi al would mention the scholars of different juristic schools, especially Ibn Hazm, in the science of letters, he refers to Ibn Masarra and in Quranic hermeneutics and theology. He refers to Ibn Barajan, uh, Qadi, Abu Bakr, Ibn al Arabi, and Abu Bakr al, al Bagilani. Uh, Ibn Arabi makes abundant references to poetry, literature, and Arabic aphorism. His books are also full of sciences of prophethood, sainthood, and miraculous acts, karamat. And he refers a lot to al Junaid, al Duha, al Noom, al Kushairi, and Abu Talib, al Mekki, among others. He also discusses issues that go beyond the capacity of the intellect. He attained this knowledge through divine openings, which was especially given to him by God and wasn't given to anyone before him. For example, Ibn al-Arabi was given knowledge about events that will be repeated every 3,000 years, among other issues related to res uh, resurrection, which wasn't mentioned by anyone before him. Ibn al-Arabi also talks about with the first, uh, metaphysics, a topic which is discussed by the philosophers and theology, uh, the, theologians. But what sets Ibn al-Arabi apart is that metaphysics to him is related to the limited elemental nature as nothing goes beyond the realm of nature, considering its absolute Rahmani dimension. Thus, when acts go beyond nature, it means it goes out of its natural habits and not completely out of nature. This means metaphorics goes beyond what people are used to see in nature and its habits, but not out of the fabric uh, of nature because it is the breath of the merciful and nothing goes above it or out of it. It's mother nature, which is unknown for a lot of people as so little is given about its knowledge and its status is above heaven as heaven and what is all in it under its feet. Ibn al-Arabi emphasizes that the knowledge of mother nature is corporate, uh, is corporeal by scripture opening and revelation, therefore the miracles of the prophets and the miraculous act of the saints do not go beyond mother nature, but it goes beyond the realm of the intellect and thus the intellect ought to understand and comprehend it even though it didn't witness it. Ibn al-Arabi doesn't skip any science as he even talks about the odd sciences in ancient civilizations as we see him talk about the builders of the pyramids and confirms that they are human beings and not jinn as, so, as some people have thought. He also informs us that the loss of the science of building pyramids is related to the fact that every civilization and epic has its own sciences, which belong to the certain cosmic time. This Thus, this knowledge is uh, perished when its epic is gone. Therefore, the science of building pyramids is related to a cosmic matter relevant to the integrating the eagle in the lion, which became integrated in the Capricorn at the time of Ibn al-Arabi. It seems that this cosmic science is also gone. Gone. Let's take another example in which Ibn al-Arabi tells us about what was written in the book, The Nabatiyan uh, Agriculture by Ibn al-Arabi Wahshia, who discusses the sciences of the civilization of Iraq, Euphrates, and Tigris. Ibn al-Arabi narrates that some of the scientists who are specialized in the science of nature succeeded in composing what looks like a human being from a human sperm which was fermented in a certain way at a certain time in a certain place. Ibn al-Arabi comments on this story saying that uh, uh, saying that a created being uh, for every opening his eyes and closing th them, but he doesn't. Uh, uh, but he doesn't speak and only eats what give what was given to him and lived him. 
Ibn al-Arabi uh, talked about merciful and about love uh, said uh, by Ibn al-Arabi. Uh, uh, and Irfan, they all agree on this principle that Ibn al-Arabi talked about by going back to the uh, uh, The interpreted meaning that Ibn al-Arabi wanted is that love uh, uh, found in there. Uh, uh, and this is for the mercy of them. And this is from the perfect of the religion. And this goes to the origin of love and respect. But the main principle, uh, Akbarian uh, principle that we uh, that the studiers should uh, uh, pay attention to when they study Ibn al-Arabi, uh, uh, according to the principles of Ibn al-Arabi, when we talk about all the concepts, whatever is clear in the presence, it goes back to the presence to the uh, ilahi uh, ilmi hazra. Ibn al-Arabi says that this is the tongue of the facts that shows itself. And it is under the al-alim al name or al-alim uh, name, under the uh, collective name Allah. And Ibn al al the student of Ibn al-Arabi, explaining uh, uh, the the uh, unknown for uh, for all is not not related to this because this is uh, because this is a degree of uh, science and a degree of love and this is related to the openness of allah and no one knows about this but allah uh, and uh, uh, so the perfectionness is two parts uh, And there is one part that describes the two perfection, perfection, perfections. And if it is related to one of the perfections uh, uh, from the our uh, from the principle of love and respect, so everything. Uh, uh, all of these things are related to our self, and this is about uh, about the hereafter, and this is related to the mercy of God. And Ibn al-Arabi uh, proves this from uh, proves this to be related to respect and love. But Ibn al-Arabi, when he says that my heart is now uh, related to God until I, my heart is God. Uh, so people repeated these uh, uh, verses and they are repeating them in every occasion and even on every platform, even political platforms. Some people think that what is meant by religions, uh, that they are re not related to uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar. This is, this is the perfect of the religion. He says that the religion is two religions and he explains himself that the religion is one, but it has two levels one at God and the other by the crea creation, by the create, uh, by the cre creation. But the only religion by God is Islam. And didn't they, he asked that, uh, they said that, don't you admit that it is Allah? They said, yes, we do. And after that, the deen prevail in dunya. And after that, they came on the mouth of a prophet. After that, it came the last religion, which is the, pro the religion of a prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the religion is not limited to one image, but to all images, as we said in the beginning, because uh, God, as uh, Ibn al-Arabi said that God is the only worshipped God, as God said that, uh, oh Lord, you, pr we, you worship only uh, him. Uh, so in this way, the servant came in every every image, but and he said that my heart became uh, that he says afterlife. He didn't say it was; he said it, be it became, and this is related to the final uh, religion, which is came in the end. Uh, so mosques and even churches they have their own times uh, to express some principles and to express the names of Allah in their own way. And of course, the final religion is related to al-ism al-jami', which is Allah. 
Allah. And Al Ismi Jama as Abdul Arabi says, it's the strongest one. So all in all, the opening, the Mecca openings of Ibn Al Arabi and his books uh, uh, witnessed his uh, distinguishedness uh, on all occasions and in all time because it is related to the Allah wisdom and it is going to stay and remain till the day after, and it's going to be somehow related to Prophet Muhammad. The last question that we have to answer, uh, are the rights and the information of Ibn al-Arabi are related uh, to, a, to, elite, to the elite, to a specific group of people or to specialized people? Uh, he talked about, uh, about Al-Futuhat, uh, 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 Ibn al-Arabi explains that he is very generous and he always is uh, generous to any guest whenever he uh, have uh, whenever he has uh, uh, guests he always open uh, make banquets and just serve them right and uh, he has their uh, uh, and and uh, and of course different people and public people can of course accept this because they are they have their fitra and they have their nature and of course if you study their his texts and his statements they uh, they can be understood clearly and i thank god at the end <laughs>